The 2000s were an era of many questionable products. Uh, there was a lot of tech companies that saw gaps in the market and thought they'd jump in on them, and most failed. They made stuff that would have interested very few of us if we'd even heard of it, which we usually never did. And that's a lot of the stuff I talk about on this channel. You know, companies like Dig Media that really thought they were gonna patch up some glaring hole in the market, but then bit off way more than they could chew. And the topic of this video, Nivius Media, was also one of those companies. They were a startup based in Los Gatos, California. Uh, they made computers, and I imagine you've never heard of them. I hadn't either, and they're long gone now, but I think they really thought they had a shot at becoming a big name, for reasons that'll become obvious, I hope. I have two of their products here. Uh, this is the Nivius Media Center Denali Edition, and its little brother here is the Nivius Media Extender Edge. And both of these devices are intimately connected, and yet they're very different. It almost feels like two different companies made them. They're so distinct, actually, that we won't even be looking at the edge today. I'm gonna to do a follow-up video for that because there's just too much to say and the tone will be considerably different. Because you see, the Denali is actually a pretty reasonable product, at least after a fashion, and as far as I can tell, it was also unique in its time. The Edge, meanwhile, is an unholy abomination that shouldn't exist, and for once, I actually mean that. It sucks, and I'm mad at it. So we're gonna set this aside for now and focus on the Denali, which really doesn't suck. It doesn't look too impressive from the front, though, so I'm just gonna spin it around so we can get started. Right off the bat, you'll notice two things. One, this is clearly a piece of AV gear, right? It's covered in RCA jacks and video ports and whatnot, but also it's clearly a PC. This is an ATX power supply, right? And that's a Windows Vista license. So you can probably guess just from those that this is a home theater PC, but it's probably the biggest one you've ever seen, right? It's also probably the heaviest you've ever seen, but you'll just have to take my word for that. This thing is an absolute tank. Now, a computer can be heavy for a few different reasons. Uh, this could be packed with hard drives, but it isn't. And it could have eight huge GPUs inside, but this one doesn't. And it could be built in a bomb-proof case for use by the military, but this one wasn't. This one is heavy because of these great big monster heat sinks down either side. It's like 30 pounds of aluminum right there. And there's only one reason it'd have those. As you can guess from the power cable, this machine is actually turned on right now. And that's impressive. Okay, maybe this doesn't impress you very much, but you have to understand this from a production standpoint. If this was a normal PC, you'd barely be able to hear me over the fan noise. Microphones pick up computer fans incredibly well for some reason. I've actually gone as far as to put a PC in another room and run extension cables under the door to deal with fan noise. It's just intolerable. But this one is almost perfectly silent because it's completely fanless. Why, why, isn't, why isn't anyone clapping for that? Oh, uh, probably because fanless home theater PCs are so common that you can just type that into Google and buy one. And that does make this sound pretty boring, I guess. Well, what if I told you that this one was built in 2007 based on a design from 2004? Would that do anything for you? Well, probably still not, but it should because passive cooling, particularly for high performance machines, wasn't really much of a thing yet. And that was a real problem, particularly for home theater PCs. Now, this might seem redundant, but I wanna summarize what an HTPC is, both because it'll be important context, and also because while many people still do use these things, most of the functionality that used to be exclusive is now available through other cheaper, simpler devices. So you might not know what value they used to offer, or I guess even what they are. The concept itself goes way back to the late 90s, and it's very simple, really. Instead of having a VCR, a DVD player, a CD player, a cassette deck, and so on in your entertainment system, you just plug a PC into your TV and stereo system and play movies and TV shows and music and whatnot. This lets you replace five or six dedicated players to take different physical formats with a single box that stores everything on a hard drive. And once you had one of these set up, you could sit on your couch and call up any form of media that you wanted without needing to flip through jewel cases or juggle three or four different remote controls. In other words, it's the exact same reason that people build Plex servers. But you might be surprised to learn that this was all possible over 25 years ago, because at a hardware level, these just aren't particularly special. The earliest HTPCs I saw were just ordinary computers in beige tower cases that sat on the carpet next to people's TV sets, and 
They ran Winamp and controlled it with a keyboard with a long extension cable. Fortunately, it eventually got a bit more refined than that. Companies started selling cases that looked more at home and entertainment centers, and people started making custom software for this that offered a 10-foot UI. That's the term for an interface that you can comfortably read from your couch, six to 10 feet away from your TV, and that you can operate from that distance with a remote control rather than a mouse or keyboard. Now, people still build and use HTPCs. I actually have one in my living room, but to be honest, it's largely been displaced by an Apple TV. And, you know, it's not really unfair to write this thing off as a 60 pound Roku, but there are a couple reasons that you couldn't just use a little box like we do now, particularly back in the day for this sort of application. The HTPC market really started heating up in the early 2000s, like 04, 05, at a time when streaming just wasn't a thing yet. Most of the services we have now didn't exist at all. There was no Spotify, no Hulu. Netflix was just a mail order DVD rental shop. Music streaming was getting started, but only in the form of like Pandora that had weird constraints. And it certainly wasn't mainstream. <laughs> So if you wanted to play digital media in your living room, you couldn't do it with a, a dinky gadget that just pulls down data over the internet. You needed something with internal storage to hold your MP3s, your AACs, your MUV files. And at the time, that meant having a full-size three and a half inch spinning hard disk, which is in itself bigger and more power hungry than an entire stream box. And if you wanted anything more than just music, you were gonna need even more hardware than that because there were few to no services offering downloadable TV shows or movies. So for TV, you'd need a tuner card so you could scrape shows off the airwaves and record them as they were broadcast. And I think the movie situation was even a little bit worse than that. Nobody offered a movie streaming or download service, as far as I could tell, until at least late 2006. And even once they did, the selection was pretty bad for a while. Now, there were commercial legal programs for ripping DVDs, but it could be a long and tedious process if you had a big collection, which at this point was very likely. Plus, they took up a ton of hard drive space. And, you know, since you had to have the DVD to begin with anyway, why not just stick it in the drive and watch it, right? It's not like music where you're going to listen to something many times or switch between artists, you know, throughout the whole day. You're going to watch like one or two movies in a sitting, right? So it's not that much work to go over and find one disc and put it in the drive. So. I think a lot of people probably skipped all the in-between steps and just used their HTPC as a DVD player. There's not much advantage in that over just buying an ordinary DVD player other than getting one more box out of your living room. And that was enough to justify it for a lot of people, but it did mean that you were blowing 250 to 400 watts an hour just to watch a movie, which sucked. And that's problem number two, actually. Oroku has a little dinky system on a chip that draws virtually no power uh, because we have custom silicon nowadays that'll decode 4K60, H.265 in just three or four watts. But in 2005, we didn't have that. And GPU decoding was in its infancy. So by default, you were doing all your video processing in software on the CPU, which was really inefficient. And if you were using the machine as a TiVo, which I imagine most people did, you were also gonna be encoding video, which was brutally resourced source intensive at a time before stuff like NVENC. There also weren't great options for low power CPUs. At best, you could get something like a VSC3, which was so low powered it could run without a heat sink, but was also laughably slow even for the era. Reportedly unable to decode even standard definition DivX in real time. Certainly it never would have handled HD video, which was rapidly becoming important. Certainly, a lot of people got away with building HTPCs around low-end hardware. There were plenty of second-hand Celerons out there playing AVI files of TV shows, but if you were building or buying a new machine, you probably wanted it to be future-proof, and in 2005, that pretty much meant it was gonna have a Pentium 4 or an equivalent AMD chip, and that was a real pickle because high-end CPUs in that era had TDPs that could go north of 100 watts, and ignoring the power bill impact, that's just a lot of heat to get rid of and home theater is one of the worst situations to be in when it comes to heat. This had never really been properly acknowledged by the market though. I mean, you gotta remember that at first, there wasn't really a market. The earliest HTPCs were all built by hand, unless you include the rare standouts like the Gateway Destination, uh, which came out in 1996, but was reportedly terrible and not very popular. Up through 2001 or so, most of these machines were homemade with off-the-shelf parts, and they ran finicky Linux-based software. I'm pretty sure I remember a couple businesses trying to commercialize this kind of setup, but without a lot of uptake. 
And then in 2002, Windows Media Center came out and it was a relatively slick, easy to configure solution that enabled PC vendors to build dedicated turnkey systems that you just brought home, plugged in and used like any other AV component. And that pretty much created a retail market for this stuff overnight. Uh, just a couple years later, magazines were doing whole roundups of machines from major companies like HP and Alienware that were purpose built to go under your TV. Now, I don't like Windows Media Center very much, but I still feel that it pretty much solved the software side of things as far as most consumers were concerned. But on the hardware side, everything wasn't so rosy. All these machines had Pentium 4s or high-end Athlons running at 65 to 95 watts, and the only way anyone knew of to get rid of that much heat was to just blast it out of the case with fans. But since we're talking about AV center devices here, you're gonna stick them in a wooden cabinet with a glass door on the front, so how's that gonna work? Well, it seems like it probably didn't. As Maximum PC discovered, HP's Z545, which was beautiful and sleek and really looked the AV center part, couldn't survive an actual AV center for more than a couple hours before the fans hit Pratt & Whitney decibel levels and the machine shortly thereafter froze. Unsurprisingly, HP expected you to run this thing in open air. They said if you put it in a cabinet with a door, you have to leave the door open or it'll shit the bed in short order. But Maximum PC had actually done that and it still shit the bed. And to wit, they asked why HP designed this to look like a DVD player, but then demanded that you don't treat it like one. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? If the point of an HTPC is to not look like a computer in the living room, then you can't require the user to treat it like one. But worse, even if you park the machine out in the open, it still has fans in there, and you know how that's gonna go. They're gonna turn on at the worst possible moment. Nobody wanted their disappointment in the climactic scenes from Serenity to be ruined by a jet turbine spooling up next to their TV. And this just remained an unsolved problem with HTPCs. What you really wanted was a machine with no fans at all, and that was very close to impossible. Obviously, nowadays, this is easy. You just get one of these gargantuan passive CPU coolers and a matching GPU. And you know, those were starting to exist at this time. Apparently even by 2003, Zalman would sell you a passive GPU cooler and a power supply and all kinds of other stuff. But as far as I can tell, no one made a fully passive fanless CPU cooler. And from what I understand, even the ones that we have now demand a pretty decent amount of airflow that I don't think you'd be able to get in an HTPC style chassis, especially if it was inside any kind of AV cabinet. So this was a sticky problem, and solving it seems to have been the principle on which Nivius Media was founded. If we go back to that 2005 roundup, sitting on top of the Alienware and the HP was a Nivius machine. It's not the one I have, but it's its younger brother, 2004's Media Center Rainier Edition. Now think about how remarkable this is. As I've learned from their then CEO's LinkedIn page, Nivius had at most 20 employees, and probably less at this point, and yet their product managed to not only make it into a hero shot in popular science alongside one machine made by a megacorp and one made by a company that was about to become a megacorp, but it's also treating both of them as its throne. This unheard of startup managed to become a headline, if only for a moment. And that's pretty wild, but they managed it by being the only company that tried to solve the noise issue. When I first saw the name Rainier, I thought that Nivius might be a Pacific Northwest company, but it's actually a reference to Mount Rainier's snow-topped peaks. In fact, their naming conventions were all themed around cold. Nivius is the Latin word for snowy, and their logo was a snowflake. So it seems like their entire intent from the get-go was to make machines that ran cool. That makes it kind of weird then that their first product had nothing to do with that. The One Box, which they released in 2003, was also a home theater PC, and a really early one at that, but it seems like that's all there was to it. It was just a mini ITX motherboard in an AV style case, no mention of passive cooling or anything. One curious thing about it is that it didn't run Windows Media Center. They went with a product from some company called Home Media Networks. I think it was called Show Shifter. I can't find much info on it, but PC Magazine suggested it was pretty much just a Media Center clone, so I'm guessing they just didn't like Microsoft's licensing terms or something. So the one box seems pretty much unremarkable, but I think they just had to put out something to buy themselves time and funding to get their real idea off the drawing board. And the Rainier seems to have been that big idea. As you can guess from the huge heat sinks, this was also a totally fanless machine. And that's the entire basis it was sold on. Maybe that's why it looked plainer than its competition. The HP and the Alienware had slick control panels with status displays and front inputs, but the Rainier just had a big metal plate with a DVD slot and a power button. But maybe they felt that their one gimmick was good enough. 
Well, uh, for what it's worth, in a 2004 roundup, Maximum PC gave the Rainier a 9 out of 10, better than anything else they looked at, solely because it was quiet and it crashed the least. They didn't post any thermal data, but we can guess that it wasn't crashing because it wasn't overheating. And a year later, they did another roundup with even more machines, and some of them got a similar score, but if you read the text, they say that the Rainier was the best of the batch. Because it was the only machine you could stick under your TV and forget about, which is what people needed from AV gear. So yeah, I think their one gimmick was good enough. And yet, that machine was still rocking a 2.8 gigahertz Pentium 4. Now, I don't know if this was the 65 watt base model or the later hyper-threading one that ran at 85 watts, but either way, it was a full fat desktop CPU that would have been getting hit pretty hard decoding and encoding MPEG-2 or MPEG-4 and possibly even HD resolutions. So, how did the Rainier deal with all that heat? Well, I can't tell you since I don't have one, but we can definitely pull apart the Denali. First, we'll finish examining it though, because there's a lot going on just on the outside. This machine clearly follows in the Rainier's footsteps, uh, including the name of another snowy mountain peak, but like Mount Denali, this one's quite a bit bigger than Rainier. And unsurprisingly, a lot of its mass is in the heat sinks. I mean, these things are truly enormous. I don't know if it comes to you on camera. They're just huge. I, I haven't measured this. What is that? Eight inches? Ten inches? Something like that? They're gigantic. They're also very complex. I'm gonna tilt this up on edge here for a second. Look at that. There's a lot going on with those fins there, man. Uh, the Rainier used these very simple straight fin sinks, but they eventually switched to this design on later uh, versions of it. And they claim this is more efficient. I don't know about that, but I can tell you that these are brutally sharp on the edges. And no matter how you carry this thing, it's gonna slice your hands to ribbons. The front panel is another big source of weight. This is like a half inch thick aluminum plate. Uh, it's not uncommon to see in high-end home theater and audio gear, and it's pretty clear that's the look that they were going for. Uh, the actual design, of course, is dead simple, other than the, the groove here. They didn't really go for much in the way of aesthetics, and there's not a whole lot going on. We've got uh, one of those fun tamper-resistant stainless steel power buttons, uh, a couple USB ports, firewire, and then a slot for the DVD-ROM, and that's it. Everything else is around on the back, but Boy howdy, is there a lot on the back. The first thing you'll notice is that they went really hard on making this not look like a PC. I mean, this thing just looks like an AV receiver. From the top, we've got uh, DVI, uh, we got HDMI component over three separate plugs, which are actually BNC instead of RCA for some reason. Now, really early stuff that used uh, component video inputs did use BNCs, but at this point in time, I really would have expected this to be RCA. That seems like an odd choice, but anyway. Below that, we have RF, S-Video, and audio inputs for two separate TV tuners, and then there's RF inputs for two additional HDTV tuners. Then we've got our network, uh, serial port, and then 7.1 audio, all as separate RCA jacks, uh, wrapped up with left and right audio inputs, and then copper speed diff. There's also USB and Firewire over here, but what you won't see is an ATX port cutout or a card cage. Without the Vista COA or the ATX power supply outline, you could easily think this wasn't a PC at all. They clearly went to great lengths to make sure this looked and felt like a high-end AV component. And this makes for an interesting personal connection for me. You see, for a couple years, I worked at a company that made amplifiers for the audiophile market. We were a really small operation, uh, so I got to see how every part of the sausage was made, and I can tell that Nivius was very similar. I recognize all the manufacturing techniques used here because they're the same ones we used and the same ones that most audiophile amp manufacturers used. So here's a fun fact for you. There's a good chance this thing was made entirely in the United States. And that's not me going rah, rah America. It's just a lot of people are probably used to thinking of this country as having basically no manufacturing capacity. That's not true and it never was, but it is true that most companies get everything made overseas because it's cheaper. But that's usually in large quantities and you can be certain this company made very few of these since as I'll explain later, they were never sold at retail. At low yields and for this style of construction, there's no need and often no benefit to going overseas. You can get every part we see here locally. That's exactly what the place I worked at did. And you can tell from the low tech assembly methods. For instance, this top panel here, these are two separate pieces of metal. Now, if Sony, for instance, had made this thing, they would have had these vent holes stamped into the sheet, but that requires you to make an expensive stamping die. So instead, this is just a single flat plate with holes probably cut with a water jet or a laser, and then the vent mesh is a prefab sheet that was just cut into a rectangle of roughly the right size and then stuck to the bottom of the cover with tape. 
So you see what I mean, right? This isn't stuff that you build a whole assembly line for. Someone was manually putting these sheet goods on the machine, hitting go on a program, and probably the rest of this was handwork as well. You know, for the finish on here, it's got like a brushed affect there. You run a wire wheel over the surface. And then for the color, you anodize it black. All done by hand. It looks a bit cruder than what Sony would sell, but it works. And more importantly, it's all stuff I could get done within 20 miles of my house and in a quantity of 10 or 20 units instead of a minimum of a thousand. I could literally get this exact thing made by making four phone calls and emailing a CAD drawing to someone. I mean, I literally did that. All the above is speaking from experience. Uh, in fact, the silk screening on the back panel here, this looks exactly like the stuff that I used to make in Corel Draw. And we had that printed somewhere in town. Uh, the front panel as well, this is just a hunk of aluminum. You can get this CNC machined just about anywhere. Uh, the most exotic part on this whole machine is actually the heat sinks. Certainly, however, some of these parts were bought right off the shelf, and among those were these RCA plugs. These look exactly like the ones that we used on our amplifiers, and they came from a company called Cardis Audio. They're made specifically for audiophile equipment, and that's why they cost $28 a piece. I'm not making that up. You can go check their part number GRFA. And Cardis doesn't do bulk discounts as far as I know. There are cheap counterfeits nowadays, but I don't think there were 20 years ago, so I'm pretty sure we're looking at $450 of luxury connectors here. And after all the handwork that went into this, the, the water jet cutting, the brushing, the anodizing, the silk screening, and the hand assembly of over a dozen $30 plugs, this is probably the most expensive back panel you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> Now, maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe these are cheap clones, but still, when I saw them, it clicked in my head that while this was being built down in Los Gatos, I was sitting 100 miles away assembling remarkably similar devices. And that colored the narrative quite a bit for me. I couldn't find much info about Nivius anywhere. Certainly no inside baseball stuff, just a couple magazine reviews and an archived website full of generic marketing crap. But looking at this thing and touching it, I realized I'm certain that they looked exactly like the place that I worked at inside. I'll be making some otherwise unfounded assertions based on that as we go along, so bear with me. Anyway, if we ignore all the heavy metal and compare this to other HTPCs in terms of features, it isn't all that remarkable. I mean, HP might have used cheaper plugs, but they still had 7.1 audio, analog and digital video, multiple tuner inputs, and so on. In fact, HP had more inputs. but. They also had a fan, and this doesn't, so there's your difference. And to be clear, this is the entire basis on which the machine was sold, or, well, the only legitimate one. Nivius had a tendency to kind of claim that they'd done things that other people had done. I'll expand on that more in the next video, where it's a lot more relevant. But just to give you an idea, the brochure offers a list of features, and it's just the list of features in Windows XP Media Center Edition. Except for that last bit, the movies, music, and more on demand. We'll address that later. But yeah, this is them putting their best foot forward. Here's the program we bought. The second list, though, is genuinely exclusive stuff. We have the Nivius Glacier TM passive cooling system, the anti-vibration hard drive enclosure, and the high-quality aluminum construction. They really did make all that, but it's also just the cooling system spread across three bullet points. And the fourth bullet, by the way, that's just them proudly announcing that they trademarked the concept of having a back panel. I mean... Really, convergence panel, TM, that's pretty dumb. It's just a bunch of plugs. It's not an accomplishment, doesn't need a special name, and convergence panel is a really bad one anyway. So in short, if you read between the lines, their own brochure makes it clear that this product is just an ordinary PC. I mean, there it is. At its initial release in 2005, it had a Penny MD, a couple gigs of RAM, some TV tuners, and XP Media Center Edition. It's very much right down the middle for the era. Now, mine is not the version from 2005, though. Nivius reused their model names while updating the hardware for several years running, which makes things a bit confusing. Uh, but this one shipped with Windows Vista Ultimate, which puts it sometime after 2006, and the CPU is a Core 2 Duo E4600, which puts it somewhere around 2007, and I'm pretty sure that's right based on the file modify times on the hard drive, so that's what we'll go with. And at this point, I should probably show you what this thing does. I mean, it almost feels pointless since it's literally the same as every other HTPC, but I guess that kind of is the point. 
See, I knew before I even got this thing home that it would just have Windows Vista and it would run Vista Media Center, just like everything else. That was Microsoft's whole intent, to dominate this market by eliminating the need for vendors to go out and find a third-party home theater software suite or to do any actual integration work. To build a commercial HTPC, you just put some hardware in a box and then installed Windows on it. You were already buying Windows licenses, so you just you know took a step to the left and bought a slightly different one. I'm sure a few companies went at least a couple feet past the mark, but Nivius didn't, and I'd like to show you that. Now, there's a couple things worth mentioning during the boot sequence. Uh, they did bother to install a custom BIOS splash screen. Believe me, I've seen vendors that didn't even bother. And then right after that clears, we see this thing. Uh, this is the Intel onboard RAID controller, and it's actually set up. As far as I can tell, this thing has its original hard drive configuration, which is two 500 gig, I think 7200 RPM drives. I never checked that. I'll put text on the screen. But anyway, uh, they've striped those together. So they're really fast, and I'm not sure if it really needed all that. I mean, I guess this thing does have multiple TV tuners, so you could be recording two TV shows while playing another one. I don't really have a way to test that scenario, but yeah, maybe that did exceed the IOPS of a single drive. So this might have been necessary, but in any case, uh, the fact that it's Intel RAID actually gave me some trouble. I don't want to get too far off in the weeds here, but I was actually very lucky to get this machine with the original software loadout intact. You see, when I first fired this up, it booted into Windows 10, which is definitely not what it came with. I later discovered that someone had been inside of it, pulled out some of the original hardware, and then left it with you know screws taken out and the hard drives unplugged. So it seems like they were in the process of converting it for some other purpose, I'm guessing a home router, because they'd added a completely redundant network card. But apparently they didn't get around to fully wiping the hard drive, because when I went to install Windows Vista, I found an Acronis True Image service partition, which to my shock actually contained the original system image. It did take me about two days to get it to restore though, because it kept telling me the image was corrupt. And when I tried to use a copy of Linux booting off like a USB drive to copy that image out of the partition, I wasn't able to do it because Linux apparently cannot talk to these Intel fake RAID controllers. Like they sort of have support, but according to everybody, it pretty much never works, at least in this era. So I wasn't able to get the files off and I really thought, you know, I was never gonna be able to recover the thing. But then just out of the blue, I thought, I wonder if it's the RAM. So I ran memtest and Sure enough, it actually was. Uh, I was able to boot Windows 10 on here and boot several different versions of Linux and uh, start a Cronus True Image and all this other stuff with no trouble. But when I tried to recover the system image, it would say it was corrupt. I replaced the RAM and it stopped doing that and restored with no trouble. I've never seen a failure that specific, but yeah, uh, I got very lucky. <laughs> So as far as I know, you're about to see the exact software that this originally shipped with, for better or for worse. So as mentioned, it's Windows Vista, and it boots up and lands us at a login screen. Hmm, the stock user account is Nivius, so I guess the password might be Nivius. Yeah, it, it was. But um, yeah, why is there a login screen at all? Like, why would they not have the out-of-box experience set up to automatically log in and start Windows Media Center? Surely they didn't expect you to sit at the couch with a wireless keyboard and type in a password, right? So we log in, we land on the desktop, and it's pretty basic. Like, we have a Nivius wallpaper, but that's virtually the only customization. I mean, if we go into the, the Welcome Center here, they do have two links to their website, and if we click on those, we get the wallpaper there, too. But that's about all they've done to make this look special in any way. I mean, does it start Media Center automatically? No. Was there a link to it on the desktop? Also no. Is there a PDF manual anywhere? Also no. The only thing they have here on the desktop to get you started is a 14 day trial for something called Autonomic Controls Mirage, which was apparently a remote control app for Windows Media Center uh, that they recommended you run on like a tablet PC to use as your remote from the couch. And otherwise, this just feels like a brand new copy of Windows with nothing installed. Uh, in fact, this is Vista SP0. In other words, it's had no service packs installed, uh, which actually fits with the time frame because Vista SP1 didn't come out until 2008. But besides that, uh, other than a couple drivers, they've just installed nothing on here. If we jump in the start menu, I installed a few extra programs, so there's some clutter in here. But the only things that they actually added uh, were this thing that says MCE Weather, and then this folder here, it says Nivius Media that just contains a link to their HD Media Store. And those are both Windows Media Center components. So let's get to the main course here. Windows Media Center, I will remind you, is an app that shipped with uh, most copies of Windows Vista other than the Home Basic Edition. So we just start this up 
and there it is. Now this is the Vista version of Windows Media Center, which is very different from the XP version, uh, but I don't like either one of them very much. I have a, a number of complaints that I don't want to get into. I'll take the time to dunk on it fully in a dedicated video someday, but I'm not going to get us bogged down in that right now. It could go on for quite some time. But if you've never seen it before, there you go. It's, it's really nothing remarkable. It's basically a PlayStation 3 cross-media bar with the serial numbers filed off and more bloated and harder to navigate. Uh, so we can go in here, for instance, and we can play music. All right, here's my music library. I loaded up a whole bunch of period appropriate MP3s that I had, none of which I can play for you. Now, you know what? I don't have any, any speakers installed anyway, so I'll go ahead and play one. We can play music and we can use the visualizers from Windows Media Player. So that's cool. Also, if I had any photos on here, oh, I guess it comes with a bunch of sample photos. Cool. We can look at a slideshow of photos, which I guess is neat if you want to, you know, show off your vacation to somebody on your TV. I mean, they're not going to be any less interested than if you did it on an actual slide projector. Uh, we can also play a DVD. Do we have a DVD here somewhere or did I take them all home? DVD. That should automatically start playing. There we go, Mr. Jameson Bond himself. I'm gonna eject that, because that is the loudest part of the machine by far, the DVD-ROM. When your machine doesn't have any fans in it, you really notice how Windows will just periodically decide to spin up the optical drive. It, it's just deafening. And it can also play videos, so I loaded it up with a whole bunch of legitimately obtained movies. I'm, I'm just now realizing that uh, Windows Media Center has no scrub bar. So you just have to fast forward. You can't use the mouse, even though it supports the mouse. Yeah, the fastest you can go is like 4X fast forward. So if you want to scrub half an hour into a movie, you're going to have to wait like five real world minutes. Man, this program's good. And the one other major feature here is the ability to record or view analog and digital TV, much like a TiVo, which were very popular at the time. I guess maybe they still are. I wouldn't know. I haven't had TV in a very long time. But I had a lot of trouble with this because the process of getting Windows Media Center to recognize local television stations by just scanning for them doesn't seem to work. And I looked this up and there were people just sort of implying that it didn't work at all, or at least that it took many hours. And uh, so I came back to do a pickup shot, which is what I'm doing right now. I, I figured I'd sit here for a couple hours and let it scan for stations. And then when I turned the machine on, uh, I think the file system's just corrupted. Windows won't boot anymore. So <laughs> Vista in 2007 problems, I guess. But from what I understand, in its heyday, it was very turnkey. You just plugged it into the internet. It would download a list of local stations and you could just tune in whatever you wanted uh, on the TV guide. You could tell it to record a program, record every episode of a program. You could live pause TV, the works. Uh, and again, this was a, a standard feature in Windows Media Center. So nothing specific to this machine. Uh, just for kicks, I did get it working very briefly briefly in WinTV PVR before it died, so here's what that looks like. There's no signal in this studio, so getting TV to show up is really hard, but a moment ago I had a frame. Here, let me give you some more cable. I'm running out of HDMI there. Oh, 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 we had a signal for a moment. Oh, there it is. There it is. We got an ad. That's television, baby. Yeah, car accident. So yeah, we just use a normal program like WinTV and it just tunes in local channels, no problem. So what did Nivius actually add here? Uh, well, there's a weather section that's supposed to show you a forecast. And this is what the MCE weather thing we saw in the start menu does. It doesn't work, of course, because all the websites this got data from are long dead, but you know, there it is. You can probably imagine what it looked like. Then if we go over to the music section and go left here, we have HD Media Store. This is apparently an interface to a long dead online music storefront called Music Giants that I'd never heard of. Naturally, this doesn't work anymore either, but we can also imagine what it looked like. And that's it. You've seen it all. That's everything the Nivius Media Center does. Uh, it's the same stuff that every other Windows Media Center machine does. But again, that's kind of the point. And I looked up a video of one of HP's contemporary competing machines. And other than some pack in crap like HP Image Center, which probably wasn't very useful. They also seem to have shipped a machine that just has Windows Media Center, and that's it. Like, I, I hate to repeat myself, but I, I think this is what HTPCs were all about. But then, what did Nivius mean in their pamphlet when they said that you could download movies on this thing? Uh, the HD Media Store only seems to have music. I can't find any mention of a movie store anywhere, so 
I think they just hoped that they'd find a service to partner with and they didn't succeed. My guess is they didn't even develop the plugin, they probably got it from Music Giants. And likewise, that weather gadget, that's just a freeware thing they downloaded, they didn't make that either. I did wonder for a moment if they sniffed the developer, uh, but I checked their website and as far as I can tell, it's pure donationware, no licensing strings attached. So I hope they at least threw the guy a few grand on his donate button, probably didn't though. So anyway, yeah, like I said, it's a PC in every sense of the term. I mean, uh, it's got a Core 2 Duo 2.4, I think, like I said. Uh, it's pretty sprightly for the most part, honestly, and it actually has a GPU. I mean, it's not great. It's a GeForce 8600 GTS, which was mid-range even for the time, but it'll run games, theoretically. This chokes pretty hard running 3D Mark 06, uh, although from what I've read, that was pretty brutal even on the best cards of the era. Uh, people have also suggested, however, that uh, this particular version of 3D Mark was kind of poorly optimized, like it was CPU constrained, so maybe the E4600 is limiting it, I don't know. And I mean, this isn't a benchmark video anyway, I just wanted to make the point that this is a completely ordinary mid-range computer. And that means that you could have had this exact experience for less than $900, especially since at this point, Media Center was just part of normal Windows. The XP version had been OEM only. You had to buy a dedicated media PC to get it, but Vista had it built in to the very common home premium edition. So nearly everyone with a new mid-range machine had it already. And yet the Nivea Denali cost between $4,600 and $6,300. That's a pretty big price delta. What could account for this massive difference? Well, the simplest answer is just uh, the usual one, economy of scale. You could make a $900 PC out of off-the-shelf parts, and it takes like four hours to get a machine built up from scratch and ready to ship if you're good. I know, because that's another job I had once. The Nivius, however, obviously includes a lot of custom parts with very high upstart cost and very slim margins, especially at the scale they were operating at, and probably an enormous amount of handwork to assemble. Putting together these big aluminum enclosures without scratching anything or snapping off bolt heads sucks, let me tell you. But even then, I mean, could this possibly have been worth five to $7,000? What special parts could be in here to justify that cost? Well, let's see just what Nivius put in the box. Oh, what's in the box? This isn't really a PC case, of course. It's more like an amplifier chassis, so it doesn't open as easily as you'd hope. I imagine this came with some gnarly warranty stickers now that I think about it. You were certainly never supposed to see inside this thing, so they didn't make it too easy. We start by removing the top cover. Uh, we got these eight big hex head screws. And lifting that off, Unsurprisingly, it's really dense in here. The top doesn't really let you get at anything, but you can sort of see uh, some of what's going on already. We've got a card cage here, a bunch of cables flying around. There's a, a CD-ROM hanging out over here. And of course the cat's already kind of out of the bag as far as the thermal management. You can see basically what they did right away. But to get a clear look at it, we have to take basically everything else off too. We'll start with the power supply, and my favorite thing is that they used different size screws for pretty much everything in the entire machine. So you've got to get like four or five bits to take this all apart. This is actually a modular power supply, and I'll talk about that in a minute because that's kind of an anachronism, but it does make it very convenient for us because I can just unplug these cables. So yeah, I don't think this power supply came with the machine. It's a Seasonic SS650KM, and it first came out in 2009. I really don't think this machine was made that late. This was actually sold for use in silent PCs, uh, but it has a fan. It's just a very quiet one that's designed to only turn on when it absolutely has to. I've never heard it, for what it's worth, even though I've run this thing for a good 30 or 40 hours. But it didn't exist in 2007, and Nivea sold this machine back then as a totally fanless setup. Uh, based on the few pictures I can find, it looks like it shipped with a fully passive power supply that had a heat sink that hung out the back and silk screening that fit the, the little cutout there. So yeah, I really suspect that this is aftermarket, and I'll show you more evidence of that in a minute. First, however, we need to pull off the front panel, and before we can do that, we have to unbolt the drive cage. This is where our two 500 gig discs live, and it's screwed to the faceplate, so we'll take that out. Now, I'd assumed that the front panel would be bolted on, but it's actually just held on by spring clips. So if I just grab this and pull, it pops right out. There we go and then we can lay that down, but all the cables for the, the power switch and the light are really, really short, so I have to reach in and unplug all those. 
And likewise, this IDE cable really doesn't want to go. But part of why I took that off is I wanted to show you this. If you're wondering uh, why the cage was bolted to the front panel, it should be pretty obvious now. It was coated in thermal paste. Spinning hard disks produce a decent amount of heat all on their own, and Nivius had to figure out how to get rid of that. So this cage here is actually part of the thermal solution. See, this is really tightly fit to the drives, and each one is sitting on a thermal transfer pad that also acts as a noise damper. Then there's a copper plate in the middle here, and the idea is that it picks up the heat from the drives, and it transfers it to this plate, which then couples it to the heat sinks. And I guess since the face plate is this big chunk of aluminum, uh, which is also a pretty good heat sink, they figured they'd just grease up the interface here. Now, what's interesting about that, if we go back to the power supply area, you can see there's all this white staining here. And when I first opened this thing up, I thought that was residue from Magic Smoke. You know, the original PSU had blown up and that's why they replaced it. But it's actually more thermal compound. You can see it's actually some liquid stuff still there in the crevice. Uh, the original supply must have also been coated in grease. Uh, I guess Nivius didn't trust the external sink to do the whole job. And the person who replaced the PSU didn't see a need to regrease it. I don't, I don't blame them since this one has a fan, it would hardly be necessary. So that's uh, <laughs> kind of gross. I've never seen anything like that in a computer before, but hey, it makes sense. When you get out of the, the usual territory of fans and whatnot, uh, things are gonna get weird. Speaking of weird, the optical drive situation is kind of interesting. I was surprised when I saw this machine had a slot loader since those hadn't really been sold for desktops after like the late 90s, as far as I knew. And sure enough, it turns out it's a laptop drive and it goes to an adapter to fit a, a full size IDE cable. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, it seems kind of awkward just hanging off the faceplate like this. It eats up a lot of internal space and the, the cabling makes that even worse, but I guess it works. So let's just unplug that. Set that aside. Next up, we have to remove the back panel. That starts with these four bolts around the perimeter. New bit. And then we've got another one at the bottom here. It's yet another bit. Oh no, it's the same one as the power supply. Well, never mind. Here I am just making up problems. And now we can start pulling this off, but of course it it really doesn't want to go so much. And you can see basically how this is built now. We've got an ordinary motherboard in here, and then we've got some like PCI, PCIe add-on cards over here, and a custom bracket that secures those cards in place. So it's basically a super minimalist ATX case that's floating in the center of a larger chassis. Uh, this is actually a very common approach for integrated PCs. The TriCaster XD850, for instance, is built the exact same way but it means that none of the ports are exposed out the back of the machine. So all this stuff on the back panel has to plug into the motherboard and the cards with these little tiny patch cables, and there's very little room for them. I mean, uh, for some it's not so bad, but others, like the DVI and the HDMI, just get folded up in here and it's really unpleasant. The connectors at both ends are under constant strain. Besides that, if you want to remove the back panel, you've got like three inches of length here before you have to unplug everything. But you know what? I think I can actually get away with not doing that. So I'm gonna leave this just the way it is. But I will comment that uh, all these cables are handmade, of course. I mean, you can't buy four inch patch cables like this for the most part. Uh, but the S video cables in particular are funny uh, because they're non-removable. Both ends have flanges that can't fit through the hole in the panel. So they must have actually put the cable through the hole and then soldered it to the connector in situ. Sure, I, I guess, whatever works. You know, I thought I was gonna have to take these side heat sinks off, but I've just realized uh, this is clear enough once I remove the power cables, you can see what's going on inside. So there it is, that's the machine. Uh, we've got an off the shelf Intel desktop board, uh, doesn't even have gamer RAM. In the card cage, we've got the GeForce 8600. We have two TV tuner cards. Uh, these are not the original ones since the previous owner pulled them out, but I just put in a couple that I'm, I'm sure are basically identical to what they would have had. Then we've got an Asus Zonar D2 sound card. So it's pretty much what you'd find in a, a like a low-end gamer rig of the era. So the only thing that makes this at all interesting is the thermal solution, which now that we see it, <laughs> isn't really all that remarkable either, except that it exists. So we've got these four blocks here that attach to the four external heat sinks. Then we've got heat pipes that go back to these copper slugs here. They get clamped in between those. And then this bottom one here sits on top of the CPU. So heat comes out of the chip, goes through this slug into the pipes, goes to the blocks, to the external heat sinks, 
and Bob's your uncle. That's the glacier cooling system, TM. It's pretty simple. And uh, nonetheless, I hadn't expected any of this. And I'm gonna go into some detail on why. I imagine you know basically how a heat pipe works, but maybe you don't. And either way, I'm gonna summarize it for reasons that'll become clear. Uh, the basic idea is this. You have a metal pipe that moves heat from one end to the other without any moving parts. It looks like a normal copper or steel tube from the outside, but the inside surface has a wick, basically metal that's been formed into either a spongy or a grooved surface. The pipe's filled with a fluid, then sealed, and when you apply heat to one end, the fluid vaporizes, travels to the cool end, and condenses, dumping its thermal energy there in the process. Then the wick carries the fluid back to the other end through capillary action, and it all starts over again. It's almost like a little refrigerator minus the compression stage and it, you know, runs itself. So heat pipes basically just magically take heat from one place and make it appear in another, sometimes through very complex routes, but with very high efficiency. And in effect, that means that this functions as if this entire external heat sink array is stuck directly to the top of the CPU. It might be kind of tough to imagine dissipating 100 watts of power without any fans, but if you think about using a sink this big with all this convection and radiation, like that's a lot more believable, right? Even better, since these are on the outside of the case and mounted vertically, they have access to nice cold air instead of the stuffy air that's inside the PC, and convection currents can travel up directly through these fins. If they were inside the case, neither of those things would be possible. I mean, if you have the option, you really want your heatsink to be on the outside of your PC. It's just normally not possible since, you know, the CPU is six inches inside the case, not over here at the edge. And in fact, when that isn't the case, people do go with external sinks. Take these uh, industrial PCs, for instance. The entire outside of this thing is a radiator. And if we open it up, take a look at the inside of this heat sink, uh, <laughs> there's pretty much nothing going on. Uh, we just have the external sink, and then they've got an aluminum block on the CPU itself uh, that just lifts the heat up half an inch. There's no heat pipes, there's no fans, nothing. And this isn't a super high performance chip by any means. I think it's like a, a, a low end Core 2 Duo ULV or something like that, but it'd still need a fan in most applications. Here it doesn't because it's plugged directly into a huge mass of metal with access to outside air. So in the Nivius, the heat pipe simply takes the thermal energy from its inconvenient location a couple inches inside the case and whisks it over to the edge where it can be disposed of externally, reducing a very difficult problem to a trivial one. If we spin this around, you can see that the GPU also gets basically the same treatment. These heat pipes are a little bit smaller, but otherwise, yeah, well, we've got a, a block on the GPU here that they definitely made from scratch. And then another one over here that attached it to the outside heat sink. It only touches one for some reason, instead of two or four, but otherwise it's uh, all the same principles. And yeah, that's it. That's the solution. And I mean, how else would you do this? Heat pipes are basically the reason that computers have efficient cooling systems nowadays. You hardly find anything passive or active that doesn't use them in some way. And yet, I hadn't really expected to see this here because I thought that heat pipes were advanced technology. I'd only ever seen these in products made by big corporations, and I assumed that you needed, you know, expensive machinery that would custom form them, crimp and fill the pipe in some kind of wild vacuum chamber or whatever, or you'd have to go to a company that just makes these and place an order for a huge quantity, and it wouldn't really be worth it unless you were making like a quarter million of something, right? With the rest of the machine clearly having been built in local job shops and mostly by hand, I was certain that Nivius would not have been able to shell out for that kind of upstart cost. But it turns out that none of this is true. You can go to a website, and I mean you personally can do this, and buy a pre-made length of heat pipe, sealed and filled, and then just carefully bend it to whatever shape you like. I found multiple companies selling exactly that, uh, so I bought one. I went and got a raw heat pipe from McMaster Car. It cost me 12 bucks, and I forgot to bring it with me for this video, but I also haven't received the parts I need in order to demo it properly, so I'll show that off in the next video, but take my word for it, it works. I put one end in hot water and the other end burned my fingers, okay? You know what, let's just do our best. I got some near boiling water here, and that's my heat pipe. Take an ice cube. Should be able to just bore right through it. I'm trying not to touch the pipe myself. There you go. Cut right through the middle there. And I got worried that it might just be the copper itself doing all the heat conducting, so here's a bit of wire I pulled out of some Romex. This is definitely solid copper. 
Let's give that a couple seconds. Yeah, that's doing nothing. Eh, got a little bit, I suppose. So, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe the copper's doing a lot of the work. I don't know. If I put this in here... Ooh, that's already getting hot. Ooh, ooh, wow. I think even at this point... Oh, yeah, yep. Wow! Man, that is impressive, I gotta say. According to the instructions, you can safely form this stuff into whatever shape you need, like right in your kitchen. There's no special tools other than a recommended bending apparatus that's pretty much like a brake line bender for a car. And there's no dangerous chemicals involved or anything. The one I bought actually uses water as a working fluid, so if I broke it open, it'd be no big deal. So it turns out this is completely approachable, even at a hobbyist level. And that makes sense since Nivius Media were pretty clearly operating at a hobbyist level. I'm not trying to get mean or judgmental here. It's just hard for me to ignore the fact that this was clearly made in a five guys in a garage type environment. Just like the rest of the machine, uh, you know, all these parts were made at a local machine shop for sure. Or I guess maybe they just did it themselves. It's not like it's hard. I just realized I can actually take this heat sink off and show it to you. So give me a moment, I'm gonna do that. They very obviously used a standard Intel heatsink bracket to hold this down, so all I have to do is pop these four push pins. There we go, and this should come right up. Oh, wow, that is so much heavier than I was prepared for that I thought it was, it was stuck on there, but no, I just didn't know how hard I needed to lift it. <laughs> wow. This, this is the first time I've actually taken this off the machine, and uh, this is so much bigger and heavier than I realized. <laughs> what a beast! Wait a minute, this is bigger than any of those massive passive coolers that you can buy nowadays. I've just realized this. This is gargantuan! <laughs> Dude's rock. <laughs> Alright, I was just going to describe this, but you can see clearly now what they did. This is a piece of copper bar stock that they turned on a lathe and they put a flare on here so that this Intel heatsink bracket will uh, clamp down against it. And I promise you they got these brackets by just breaking them off of Intel heatsinks. There's no way they were able to manufacture this stamped sheet metal or the injection molded plastic, right? It's obviously off an Intel heatsink. So they just made this copper slug that goes in here and then they made these two the same way, you know, turned them on the lathe. And what I noticed about this, at first I was thinking it looked pretty rough, but then I looked a little bit closer and I realized the top edge has actually been faced off and they broke the edge here. They actually put a little bit of a chamfer on it. So that's actually not nearly as bad as I thought it was at first. I mean, it looks like something that you'd see on the hard OCP forums back in like 2002, uh, but it, no, it's, it's about as good as it could be for what it is. Now, I don't know whether they would have put these two slugs on a milling machine and you know clamped them up in a vise and used a ball end mill to make these grooves, or if they cross drilled them with like a drill press, because now that I look at it, these are close enough to the top that they, they probably could have just drilled all the way through it now that I think about it. Likewise, these blocks that mount to the external heat sinks, those are obviously just pieces of billet aluminum. Uh, wow, they didn't really do much more than just cut them to size and uh, mill these grooves into them. But again, they did bother to chamfer the grooves and then, of course, they had to put uh, these slots in here for the pipes with a ball end mill. So I imagine those were custom machined. I don't think you could get that off the shelf. But uh, this is all really easy stuff, is the point. And I know this because I remember my mom doing pretty much the same thing in our garage when I was 12, making a water block for a homemade water cooling system with tools we bought from Harbor Freight. So yeah, this could have been farmed out to a shop like all the other parts, but it was probably cheaper to just buy the tools and do it in-house because there's no real precision involved. So yeah, it's all very mom and pop. The whole thing is cute, honestly. It's so scrappy. These guys managed to get a hard OCP forums show off rig into a half dozen paper magazines right next to national brands. You gotta respect that hustle. But I think it does beg the question, is this any better than the 2007 equivalent of Reddit gold bait? There were certainly plenty of machines people built back then that had very impressive looking homemade cooling systems that it didn't really work all that well. And I'll be honest, looking at this thing, I didn't really think it worked very well either. Let's be clear, I'm not a thermal engineer, okay? The only thing I can really do to prove if it's good or not is to see if it overheats under load. And sorry for the spoiler, but it doesn't. What I can't tell you at all, however, is if it performs as well as it could. And there are some qualities here that make me wonder about that. 
Uh, consider this. If a large company like Zalman, for instance, were to build this kind of thing, I can assure you, instead of having these four huge pipes flying way above the CPU like this, with a massive copper in between them and the die, they'd have had more like eight or 12 smaller pipes that would bend way down so they could press directly against the CPU heat spreader. And we know Zalman would do it that way because they did. They made one of the very few fanless machines that existed in the early 2000s. And sure enough, it used lots of little tiny pipes and a very low profile mount. I didn't mention this earlier because you couldn't buy it as like a generic part to put in a PC. You had to buy the whole machine as one unit. Does, doesn't really count. But that approach seems ideal to me because the pipes are so close to the CPU that they can pick up the heat the moment it leaves the heat spreader. Whereas here, it has to first heat up this whole copper slug and then sort of soak through the other ones as well before the pipes can slurp up their very first BTU. But I can see why this was done, I think. I mean, it makes hand bending the pipes a lot easier. You've just got this single curve in here and you're done. Instead of having to curve it this way and then down and then back up and, and do it over and over and over again for a whole bunch of pipes. But I do suspect that it makes the CPU run hotter than it needs to. Because no matter how effective the heat pipes are, they're only gonna cool off the top of this hunk of metal. The bottom half is still gonna be holding a bunch of heat that has to conduct upwards before it can be disposed of. How fast does that conduction happen? I don't know. Maybe it's quick enough that it doesn't matter. Uh, I also noticed that the pipes are coated in thermal compound, and that's kind of weird. Like, my first reaction was that it was unprofessional since it was all smeared down the side of the block, but obviously someone has been in here, so maybe that was done by whoever replaced the power supply, right? But it made me realize that I'd never seen thermal compound used in a commercial heat pipe system. So I, I did some Googling and reading, and I learned that yeah, apparently they're usually either soldered on or affixed with thermal epoxy, and neither of those would have really been an option here. I mean, I mean, soldering would have been problematic due to the enormous mass of copper that you'd have to bring up to temp. You'd have to either hit it with a gas torch, uh, which isn't something you want going on in your little computer factory, uh, or you'd have to buy some special industrial oven, which would have been a really unpleasant expense for a single-use item. So. I guess I get it, and let's be honest, in a small operation where everything's done by hand, you screw up all the time and you have to rework stuff. Both solder and epoxy would make that impractical, whereas this can just be unbolted and taken apart. So yeah, uh, does compound work any worse than solder or epoxy? I don't know, probably not. It's just that nobody else ever seems to do it this way. So yeah, I, I had my doubts about how well this was gonna work, but the proof's in the pudding, right? I don't have the chops to formally analyze this thing, but I do own an IR camera and I can run speed fan. So I fired the machine up, I ran Prime 95 and a GPU benchmark and I let it cook for a bit. And the results, I have to say, were pretty impressive. The CPU package never got above 65 degrees Celsius. Uh, that's about 150 Fahrenheit. It's not frigid by any means, but it's still totally reasonable. And I ran the machine for several hours like this. It never breaks 65C, according to speed fan. That seems pretty good. It's also weird though, because I don't know where the heat's going. Per the thermal camera, the heat sinks serving the CPU never get any hotter than the surrounding chassis. Like they get up to about 35C, but so does everything else, including like the top cover. And a lot of that heat is definitely coming from like voltage regulators on the board and the passively cooled chipset, which gets really toasty. Now, maybe the CPU cooler is just doing a really bang up job. You know, it's diffusing the heat through the sinks so evenly and so quickly that I don't even see a rise in temperature. Uh, it could also mean the pipes aren't doing anything and the CPU is roasting down there, throttling to hell and back to stay alive, but I really doubt that. The machine doesn't seem sluggish. Like when your CPU is throttling, your PC feels like a 386. And from what people say, uh, 65C is like 20 degrees below the throttle threshold, so it seems like we're good? But it feels really weird though, that the sinks wouldn't be any warmer than the rest of it. The CPU is supposed to be 65 watts, and I'm not sure I'm hitting that TDP, but surely it's putting out a decent amount of power at 100% utilization for two hours, right? I mean, going back to what I said about the, the heat block, before the pipes can do any work, the copper needs to come up to temp. Uh, but after hours of 100% utilization, like touching the sink itself, it was just barely above room temperature. It gets even weirder when you take a look at the GPU side. If I spin up a 3D benchmark and leave it running for 15 minutes, the sink serving the graphics card gets hot to the touch. I mean, it's a good 11 degrees Celsius above the rest of the machine, including the sink right next to it. And that's what I'd expect. So these heat pipes, at least, are clearly doing their job. And if I touch one when it's under load, I'll actually get a little burned. They get toasty. 
And you can't see this so well on the IR camera because they're reflective, but somebody told me if I stick some black tape to the pipes, it'll fix that problem. So I did, and yeah, sure enough, they read over 51 degrees Celsius. So there's a lot of heat in there, and the pipes seem to be getting it over to the sink just fine. According to RevaTuner though, the GPU never breaks 60 degrees C, and that makes this all so much stranger, because the CPU is reporting a temperature five degrees above that. Where is it all going? I'm confused, but hey, again, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about, so I can only make one conclusion. This system works. And we can't be certain of any of these exact numbers, uh, to be clear. I'm told IR cameras aren't always super reliable when it comes to precise temps, but I think the relative figures are clear enough. All this seems to jibe with what I'd expect, and in any case, it hasn't blown up on me after hours of use, so it seems like the Glacier TM passive cooling system is the real deal but was it really worth what they were charging for it? <laughs> well, maybe not, but only by our standards, and I don't think this was for us. As I mentioned earlier, this was not a retail product. Even though it got reviewed in a consumer magazine, you couldn't just go out and buy a Nivius Rainier or a Denali in a store or even by calling the company. Instead, this is something you'd get from an installer. Now, this is a field I've never had any reason to interact with myself, uh, but there are plenty of people out there who I guess can't plug the yellow cable into the yellow hole, sometimes because they physically can't, I'm sure, but also sometimes because they're just too apathetic to read the two page getting started section in the manual and figure it out. So they pay other people to come out and set up their TV and VCR and DVD player and whatnot. Or at least that's what the middle class market is interested in. You know, the people with the McMansions. The upper class, the people with the true mansions, they want a very different thing. I don't know if you've ever been in the house of someone who has a really phenomenal amount of money, but uh, I don't know if this is true anymore. I don't know if they do this anymore, but at least in past decades, you'd often see in-ceiling speakers in every room uh, that all tied back into a single source, like a bunch of gear hidden away in a closet somewhere with wall panels in every room to control the routing and the volume and whatnot. That's not the sort of thing that even the above average DIYer is likely to install themselves. I mean, this is stuff you usually can't even buy at retail because no one component is useful unless it's backed by dozens of other components that all have to be from the same company, plus miles of in-wall cabling. So the minimum investment is up in the many thousands of dollars. So you hire an installer who goes to a company like Leviton who make whole product lines specifically for this kind of market and can place a big order on credit. And that's the kind of market segment that I believe Nivius Media was targeting. If you went to their website, there was no sales contact number, no email, you just went to a find a dealer page and you located a middleman. And this is the sort of thing that small manufacturers want. They don't like dealing with end users. They don't have the manpower for it. So they have you go through an installer who handles the upfront sales, reads you the pamphlet over the phone, charges you for the product itself, does the installation, so support calls are less likely. And then if there is any support, they absorb it instead of the manufacturer. And of course, in the market segment where your clients all have mansions, they also invariably know jack shit about technology and are constantly pissed off and self-righteous about everything. Not like us at all. So that support work is a particularly important element, especially because even if you were a clueless asshole, you might have still noticed a few problems with this thing. For one, it might be fanless, but it's not dead silent. Uh, you may have noticed this earlier. It still has spinning hard drives, and despite the anti-vibration pads and uh, my smug declaration that this thing is so usable on camera, you could probably still hear them spinning. And during quiet moments in movies, I'm sure you'd still notice the drive noise once in a while. The solution, of course, was to do what usually gets done in mansions. Don't put the machine in the same room as the TV at all. I mean, it seems pointless to spend a fortune on a passively cooled system and then just stick it in a closet anyway, but there's still some advantages. I mean, there's fewer moving parts to fail, there's less sound isolation required, and it might be better equipped to handle being in a stuffy little closet than something with a normal fan. Uh, another reason to do that, though, is that, yeah, this thing is absolutely massive. It's bigger than any AV component I've seen in my life, and there aren't that many entertainment centers it would have actually fit into or looked good in. And on top of that, we actually have to go back to the matter of price. I'm sure a few normal people shelled out for one of these and just put it on a credit card, but the target market was probably mostly people who had more money than cents. I mean, the HP and Alienware competitors may have been a little noisy, but they were also only two grand, so... Christ, just put the thing on top of your AV cabinet where it doesn't get too hot, then drown your aesthetic concerns with the 10 cases of top shelf champagne you can afford with the money you have left over, okay? 
But even if you could square yourself with buying one of these, two would have been stretching it, let alone three or four, even if you were pretty moneyed. And the trouble is that the kind of person this was probably aimed at didn't usually have just one entertainment center. They had two or four or, or a dozen. And even an awful lot of average Joes at this point in time had a TV in the bedroom. The whole point of Media Center was to centralize your media. Who wants to go through the trouble recording a bunch of Star Trek episodes if you can't watch them in bed? That's where you watch Star Trek. It's one thing to be rich enough to drop eight grand on a mediocre PC, but you have to be really out there to spend 50 or 60 grand equipping your whole mansion. And if you weren't actually tremendously wealthy, there was no way you were dropping another four digits just to cover the bedroom. Fortunately, however, there was a solution. Let me, let me button all this up. A few years into Windows Media Center's lifespan, Microsoft started a program for third-party vendors to produce Media Center Extenders, uh, which did exactly what they sound like. Uh, this is a slightly later model. It's from like 2009, but from what I've read, they all seem to work the same way. Let me get this out of the box here. You know, I had a line in the script where I was gonna call this a little metal box, but it's actually a little plastic box. This is the Linksys uh, DMA2200, I think it's model number. It's a nice, sleek little box. It'll fit comfortably on top of your DVD player or whatever, although it actually is a DVD player itself as well. And on the back, we got a bunch of outputs like you'd expect. Uh, HDMI, component, composite, S-video. We have copper and optical digital audio. And then we have a network interface. The idea is that you'd put your actual media center PC in either your primary living room or tucked away in a closet somewhere and then under your TV or TVs, you'd have a little box like this that does nothing more than connect back to your media server over the network and stream videos and music. That way you could have one expensive machine and then six much cheaper streaming boxes. In other words, we've been doing Plex forever. Now, these things were very inexpensive and very easy to use. This one cost about $350, and all you do is bring it home, plug it in, turn it on. Your Windows Media Center will just pop right up and ask if you want to connect it, and that's that. Now, I've configured this one already, so I'm just going to plug it in and show it to you real quick. All right, I've got this uh, plugged into the Nivius Media Center through a, a little home network here. Uh, the extender's powered up, and I just have to go over and pick Windows Media Center. And there it is. Uh, I can now go up to pictures and video and let's watch a movie. And there we go, we got Tron. Uh, and it's playing just like it would on the PC itself. So obviously this is... <laughs> uh, it's okay, it happens to a lot of men. Obviously, this is pretty exciting, and it smooths over several of the Denali's pain points, right? Like, if you don't need to actually put this thing in your living room, or in each of them anyway, then it doesn't matter if it's huge and expensive and emits an irritating noise. And Nivius clearly recognized this since they immediately started reselling these things. The then current Linksys extender appears to have been one of the bigger names in the market and Nivius had it listed on their own website's support section, including manuals and drivers. So I have to assume that they were bundling these with their servers. And that makes a lot of business sense, but apparently it wasn't satisfactory. Not sure exactly why. I've read reviews of the Linksys Extender and they all seem blindingly positive. Even the first generation one, people apparently loved them and they didn't cost very much and they didn't seem to have had fans. So I don't know what possible improvement you could make on all of that. My guess is just that Nivius didn't like reselling anything and they wanted wider profit margins because in late 2007, they announced their own in-house product, the Nivius Media Extender Edge. That is, of course, the device that I showed you at the beginning of the video. And it probably goes without saying that it's uh, more than half the reason that I bought this whole setup. I actually saw both of these, just like this, uh, sitting at our local used computer store about six months ago, and I've been just walking by them for quite some time, because uh, they seemed incredibly boring. I looked them up and, and they just didn't, didn't seem like that big of a deal. But then I took a closer look at the Edge and I got interested. The Denali really isn't all that remarkable, but this thing on the other hand, this case hides many sins. And I won't be going into the details, uh, that'll be a later video, like I said, because it's, it's its own thing, believe me. But I'm gonna at least turn it on for you. That's the least I can do.
And I'll be explaining what the hell just happened there in the next video. Stay tuned. You can tell, it'll be the spicier of these two meatballs. But I hope this one was tasty enough. I try my best when confronted with something apparently banal to find some reason to take interest in it, even if it requires picking the smallest nits I can find. And this thing didn't really have much going on other than the obvious. It's definitely weird as PCs go, and I think unique for its time though, so hopefully you had a good time. If you did, it'd be cool if you subscribed to my channel so now you like this sort of thing. And if you want an extremely slim chance of being notified when that next video comes out, then maybe turn on notifications. It won't work, but you could try anyway. If you really enjoyed this, however, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these people are doing. I really couldn't do any of this without their support since this is my full-time job. These kind people on your screen pay for my groceries, my studio space, gas in my car, and weird crap like this that I buy hoping it'll turn into a video, never quite knowing for sure. So I'm incredibly grateful to everyone who's supporting me on there. They all make this possible. Thank you all so much. And everyone else, thanks for watching.